rest and soap are two dominant types, but generally they, they are standardized. So web services are a good interface, especially for uh, when you're trying to stand up something in front of a legacy system, and you're trying to bring that legacy system into the, you know, this century, <coughs> basically. You can put a web service in front of it and have the web service do the translation to the proprietary protocols for you, but everyone, all the clients can access your legacy systems uh, through this common interface. They're also very good when deployed correctly for security. You can stand web service up in front of your databases, abstract those databases away from the clients, such as web applications or the mobile apps, <coughs> they can't actually access the database, they have to go through this web service layer. So the RESTful services are the first type we're going to look at today. Generally, we're going to go back and forth between RESTful and so the entire day. So RESTful services, there's a nice big giant long description there, but essentially there's a couple of key points about them to keep in mind if you're a tester. The first one is, is that the RESTful service is not independent of the HTTP protocol. It actually reuses some of the methods in the HTTP protocol to transmit information. <coughs> and what I mean by that is RESTful services uh, reuse the method get post put the that means something else entirely in a regular web app. And they use those methods to tell the backend service what action needs to be performed. So for example, again, it would be maybe fetch some kind of record from the database or get some file, maybe get a PDF or whatever. A foot is actually going to send information to be stored or maybe send a document. And then you have to leave, which is exactly what it sounds like. And then uh, post. So the uh, the other key point about RESTful services is the objects that you're interacting with are abstracted away. They think of them as resources. So you may be trying to get or put a file, or you may be trying to get or put a database record, but it's a little fuzzy sometimes exactly what that object is implemented is in the background, which is actually nice because you can abstract away how the object is being processed from what it is you're actually offering at the client. Let's look at these by example. So here we see a put and a get. These are the HTTP requests that would be sent by the client. It could be a browser, perhaps. It might be a phone. It could be saying anything. So in the, in the put, we're actually saying, hey, let's create this record for <coughs> JDO. We pass in uh, JDO as a parameter. That's the username, and then we have the address being passed in as a standard query parameter. Then in the get example, we're doing the opposite. We're pulling the JDO record out of the system, asking the system to give that record back to us. Tell us about that person. So a couple more examples. We have a post and a delete. So the, the post in this case uh, is actually posting Instead of using a URL query parameter, the address has been moved down into the body, so it's it's actually literally a post request. And notice also information is being transmitted to the user. Then in the delete request, we have JDO being passed as part of the path. So if you look at these four and break them down as to where information is being passed, you can see that if we pass information in the path, as in JDO, we pass in information as URL query parameters, the address in the, in the put. But we can also pass information in the post and in the cookies. So there's, generically speaking, there's about four different input uh, parameter locations in a RESTful service. And that's one extra than you generally see in a normal web application, something that they are aware of. The one extra one is the path. Typically in a regular web app, the path to the file is the page you're trying to browse to. But in a RESTful service, a lot of times parameters in the path itself. SOAP-based services, a little bit differently in the way they transmit information. So a SOAP service is independent of the protocol that's being used to carry it across the network. It's usually used with HTTP protocol to transmit it back and forth. That's typical, but it doesn't have to be. 
uh, carried by HDB. It could be a remote procedure call. It could be carried by TCP, perhaps, or even UDP. The SOAP, sir, the SOAP is carried in uh, these constructs called envelopes. And there's a message inside of the envelope. You can think of it as you have what's been delivered, and then you have the delivery mechanism totally independent. So remember, the rest was actually incorporated into the HTTP protocol. They can't be split out. It's a little bit uh, different mechanism there. There's there's probably um, <coughs> some arguments against this, but I don't really see SOAP or REST as being better one better than the other. It's two, two different tools. It depends on the situation. It certainly depends on the protocol you're going to use to carry the, the message and, and some other factors. It also depends on do you think of your resource that you're interacting with as traditional data or a traditional transaction, which would lend itself more towards the SOAP-based services, or are you thinking of the, the objects you're representing as the abstract concepts like files or, or records? One of the keys about uh, the SOAP-based services that there really is no argument about is if you don't have a wisdom, it's pretty hard to uh, figure out how to call these things. They're, even the simplest SOAP-based service call looks very complicated when you're trying to figure out as a tester, how do I interact with this thing? We'll take a look at Wisdoms later. <coughs> Sorry? Can you define that as a Wisdom? Oh, Wisdom is the uh, web service descriptor language. It's a document that tells you how to call the web service. So it's going to tell you things such as, uh, that you need to send the username and a password, or you need to send a record ID. So for example, here's the SOAP-based envelope. So you have the purple, which is the uh, actual envelope declaration itself. The blue is an optional header where you can pass some meta information. The darker blue is the start of the, the body itself, where you're going to transmit your message. And then the red is the uh, the parameters. So in this case, we have two parameters. We have uh, a username and a password being passed. And this is what the SOAP would look like if it were being carried by an HTTP post. So we have the HTTP headers at the top, and the SOAP envelope is just the payload. It's independent of the HTTP protocol. So when we look at the rest earlier, the actual methods of the HTTP header, and some of the headers themselves, maybe the cookie or something like that, could actually be part of the message. So the takeaway here is, is the injectable parameters are in that XML that's being transmitted in the request. That's where you're going to target your testing. So how do we find these web services? Well, the good news is, is that we can find these services in the same way as we find regular websites, at least for the um, RESTful services, because the RESTful services are going to react a lot like regular web pages. You're going to browse to some URI, and you're going to get some kind of response back. One of the ways to tell the difference between what you found in a RESTful web page <coughs> and a web page is the web services tend to respond with structured formats like XML or JSON. So if you're doing um, spidering and your responses come back to JSON, you probably found some kind of web service and it could be a RESTful web service. You may also see some XML come back for some kind of structured format. It doesn't necessarily have to be one of these standard protocols, but it's probably also not going to be HTML that comes back. So you can spider the site using that. Uh, you can Google for the services because they get indexed like everything else and search for keywords like REST or API, things like that. And you can also look at the content type that comes back in the response. Tools like Burp Suite <coughs> or Zap can pull those content types out for you and show you what the content type of the document was. So you can actually check it out and say, well, if that's JSON or if that's XML, then it could possibly be a service. Uh, the way I usually do it, since I work for a corporation internally, is I usually just ask. 
where are your services giving the URI? Tell me how you can take them. So, so base services, a uh, little trickier to find sometimes because they're not necessarily going to be advertised. They might be advertised in a directory like a UDDI server, but that's getting more rare nowadays to find these uh, universal directories where you can pull a uh, web services offered by the company. It seems that in practical terms, uh, one of the better ways I've found to look for them is go ahead and spider the sites and add question mark WSDL to the end of all the pages. If it's a soap based web service, a lot of times what will happen is, is you'll trigger the whistle to be returned back to you in that document that tells you how to call the web service. So perhaps uh, not very clever, but it seems to work. You can Google and Bing for it with the end URL, uh, question mark whistle, or file type is whistle, try those. And the content type, same as the RESTful services, or you, know, you can just ask. You're able to get away with that. All right, so mapping web services. When we're talking about mapping, we're talking about how do you call these <laughs> services. If you're a QA tester, one of the things that's going to be most important to you is how do you send the QA request to the service and get a valid response back? If you're a security tester, you're primarily concerned with how do you send a request to the web services and get an invalid response back? So only a slight difference. So mapping RESTful services, really what you want to do is um, read the documentation first and foremost, because most of the RESTful services are ad advertised APIs, and the documentation is usually pretty good. They may or may not be within your own internal company, as on the uh, policies and how the internal development works, but certainly the public ones are pretty well documented. They actually give you examples of how to call them and so forth. And you can spider the site. You can look for uh, pages, URIs, that respond to not just gets and posts, but do they respond to puts and deletes. Even if you get an error back when you say put this resource, if the error is coming back in JSON or XML, then you probably figured out how to call uh, that service. So you may just then read the error messages and a lot of times the area will tell you, you know, you should have had Brian or XYZ when you made this call. So you can kind of figure it out just by interacting with them. Again, don't overlook this, just ask. So that's a great way to figure it out. So to map these services, we're going to exercise each of the service with the HTTP verb, put it post delete. We're going to create a legitimate request that works. And we're going to save that as our baseline, because we're going to use that later to compare against all the other requests that come back. And so at the end of this phase, what you should have is all the services and all the methods in the service, all the service offerings, all the verbs that are legitimate. So it may, it may or may not be most of those to leave. Those are just the most common. It could be others as well. And then you want to have those valid baseline calls for each of the services. And we're going to go through some examples where you can kind of see this in practice. So for SOAP-based services, when you're doing the mapping on these, um, it's not, not usually as easy. Even if you read the documentation, a lot of times the docs are hard to read. It turns out if you can get a hold of those WSDL files that we're going to show in a minute, you can parse them with tools like SOAP UI, and then you'll be able to have that tool take the WSDL apart and build sample requests for you. And it even lets you send them. There's a little play button that you can send them. We'll give that a try. It's basically a lot of the same process, though. For each of the services offered, we have to have that baseline request. That's the most important piece to start with, because again, you're going to use that request later to later on to compare the other responses that come back when you send funny values of the service and look to see if there's any differences. Your deliverables are actually the same deliverables as in the RESTful services. So next, we're going to talk about 
testing the web services. So we need to break that down into a couple different categories. There's how do you test them? How do you actually uh, send these requests, get these responses, and make these comparisons? There's this practical aspect to it. And then what is it, what is it that you're actually testing <coughs> for? What are you trying to find? What's the end game? For the RESTful services, um, we're going to recognize that these can be tested using the regular tools because you can even, well, a lot of times you can use Firefox to test them, but we're going to use tools like Burp Suite or Zap so we can make these repeatable requests where we don't have to type stuff in there. You just kind of hit like a go button and get these requests to repeat. We've identified the injection points, so we know that there were four for the RESTful services that we pointed out, and we noticed that extra spot where the RESTful services tend to have input. So now we know where to send our test input. That's pretty much what I do all day long. Just a fuzz them all, let them sort out. Maybe that or helpful. Okay, so this is kind of our script for testing the represent, the resin, uh, I'll just say rest. Too early. <laughs> we're going to locate the server, identify the services, for, and then for each server, we're going to do this loop where we get this based on request, and we're going to send uh, test values into all four locations, trying to figure out if any of the responses are different than the baseline response. And I'll put these slides up later so you don't have to take notes or anything on this. So we've noted the differences between the regular web services and the RESTful. We wrote down our typical verbs that we're going to try to test. And uh, we made a note that uh, about the four positions and that the data may be returned in either JSON or XML. So you need to be kind of flexible about what kind of responses you're getting back. And again, it could be proprietary. Sometimes I've seen a couple of services that somebody just kind of made up and the format was like, uh, say, kind of separated values or type limited or just, you know, something that the developer just kind of invented on the fly. Okay. So for doing the demos, we're going to look at um, using Matilda Day. I've actually added SOAP and RESTful services into the tool so that we can have a testing platform. So uh, I've downloaded SOAP UI tool, and I've downloaded Burp Suite free. Both of the versions I downloaded were free versions of the respective tools. Just as far as a, a little bit of setup goes. You've used both. Do you have a preference one over the other? I use them in tandem so that I get the strengths out of it. Each one. one of them, each, uh, I'll walk through that for you, but you'll see that one of them is really good at one thing, and really good at another. So, so if we combine them, we'll, we'll get the best effect. So we're testing RESTful services right now, and I got a, so we're actually going to ignore SOAP you out here. Back this up a little bit so you can see how to get there. So on OWASP uh, version 263 <coughs> or higher, 263, 264, which I'm going to put out later this weekend. There's this web services menu. And then we're going to go into REST for now. And do the SQL injection one since that's the only one offered. Well, gee, there you go. <laughs> we browse to the service, and this is what we get. But like I said, a lot of times the documentation, if you just browse just to the service with no parameters or anything like that, a lot of times you'll actually get documentation like in this one. 
This documentation is kind of hard to read, so we'll look at it in another tool here. This is going to be painful trying to do this testing through Firefox. I'm just using Firefox to make the initial request to generate this request that we can work off of. But I've actually proxied Firefox through your Burke suite. Let's go back here to the proxy tab. So if we turn the intercept on in Burke suite <coughs> and then browse again, actually let me back up. So when I say proxy, um, what I mean is if we go to preferences really quick and we go to the advanced network settings, I'm proxying Firefox through localhost AD. And then if you look at first suite options, you can see that it's listening on AD. So all the web traffic is going through this tool first suite. And if you'd like uh, to see how to use this tool, I've got a one hour video on the uh, YouTube channel that explains how to set all this up. And I'll give that out, link out at the end. Okay, so let's browse to that service again. You can see the request was sent by Firefox and it was caught by Burke. So now we have a request. We can start to manipulate it. We'll forward that onto the server and wait for the server to send the response back. And here's what we were talking about earlier. If we read through the documentation, we'll see that there's a default get. If you don't send any parameters at all, we get a list of accounts. If you do a get, then and you send um, a username and a password, or excuse me, a username, <coughs> one of those usernames, one of those accounts, then you'll get back information about that account. You can do a post, which creates new accounts, a put, which will either create an account or it'll update an account. It depends on if it already exists. And then there's a delete, kind of obvious. And then here's your accounts to pick from. So we can pick uh, Adrian, for example. All right, so we'll forward this back to the browser. I'm going to make one more request because, like I said, it would be tedious to keep going back to Firefox, set some parameters, run it through Burr, rinse and repeat. Instead, let's right click and send this over to the repeater so we can, uh, then we'll release the center set and just let Firefox be on its own. And here's our request in the repeater to make sure it still works. Hit go, and we have a baseline request because it works. We can just keep, keep hitting go over and over again. <coughs> And on the, um, the get, remember it told us that if we passed in one of those accounts as a username parameter, then we should get a different response. And we were going to pick Adrian, so I'm just going to add the username parameter instead of to Adrian and pick go. And sure enough, there is the response. We can do similar for the post and the put by right clicking and saying change the request method. Or it will automatically rearrange the request into a post so we don't have to go manually type all that stuff in. And if we read the post documentation, that was a little bit different. Earlier I said, well, sometimes you can just interact with the services and they'll give you these error messages that'll tell you, you know, hey, do you do it this way or whatever. Those are actually pretty nice, believe it or not. So this one says, hey, post parameter password is required. Oh, okay, so we have to add on that post parameter. And I don't know what Adrian's password is, but on the account I created earlier, the password is this awesome super secret password I see a lot. So let it go. And, well, we can't create that account because that account already exists. So, can I ask a question really quick? Sure. So if we go back to Adrian on the post request, uh -huh. put in password and just leave it blank. Uh, what is the message that you get back? Probably Adrian already exists. Does it tell you, does it give any, any indication that the password was incorrect? Oh, um, yeah, that one's kind of confusing, I guess. The, so on the post, since we're creating the record, we're actually setting the password as opposed right. to um, yeah, so it is like yeah. the password, I'm sorry. That was if on you pass a no, do you get any information back? Right. That's gonna be one of your tests that we're gonna do later, because you're gonna pass you're gonna pass <coughs> blanks and nulls is not actually the same thing. You're gonna pass both right. of those. So we're gonna try that. 
So you, you can see that a delete and a uh, put would be pretty similar to a put. We would just type put. Now this should work because remember put updates or creates an unlimited account in case or not. So we updated Adrian's password form. All right, Adrian, you're just from 40 compliant, but <laughs> so now let's go to um, the the next phase, which is we want to do some testing. Let's go back to the get, change the request method back to the way it was. We don't need the password parameter. Well, it doesn't hurt to send it, I guess, but we don't really need it for the, the get. It didn't say we couldn't send it. It just said we don't have to. So we do a get for Adrian, there's Adrian's account. All right. So now, it took off the signature. Can we update it? Oh, yeah, you're right, because I didn't pass in the optional signature, so I did it with a blank. Yeah, so I blanked it, it out. Right <laughs> All right, so we could do some testing from the repeater tab. We could say, I'm going to send in, um, well, it actually would be kind of hard to type a null, so why don't we send in like percent zero zero? As, uh, his suggestion. Let's see what happens. Huh. I did something weird too. It doesn't seem to have heard anything, but it didn't match any parameters. So it is processing the null, but it looks like it's processing it correctly. And then we get to do like percent zero one, percent zero two, and go through all these different hexadecimal decimal characters to see what happens. That would take a while. Let's do it this way. So let's send our, let's go back and get a baseline request. That works. We're always going to start from the baseline. Okay, that works. Now we're going to right click and say send to the intruder so that we have the baseline request loaded in the intruder. And then this tool will let you pick some positions to fuzz, and it's going to automatically fuzz those. We're going to clear out the cookies because these parameters are not for this web service, so we don't want to fuzz those. But we do want to fuzz this field. <laughs> So, payloads, what are we going to send in there? Any suggestions? Yeah. Gmails would be good. So, would you try to do like some enumeration? Invalid characters? Definitely. Definitely going to send in uh, those <coughs> on every service. Let's start with the invalid characters because that's the easiest to generate. So, Go back here. I think I got some notes. Wait for it. There we go. So there's a little Python script you can run. It's just um, you know a four number in range. I'll post these notes later. Zero to 128. We're going to print the character represented by that number. No, I like writing all of them. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the range 0 through 128 is going to give us the character 0 through 127. And we put those off into a file. And I put it into this folder. <coughs> okay. So we have this web service fuzzing values that TXT had generated by that Python. And it's just a bunch of characters. I went ahead and took out the letters and the numbers because those are actually probably legitimate values, we, we want to do the opposite of what QA does. So QA says, let's figure out how this thing works and only do that and do it right. You know, um, don't send any invalid numbers in there. And then the pen tester says, let's do everything else. So we're going to do everything else. Okay, so we can hit load. It would be, you could add them here, but it would take a long time to add 128 characters. Do a load web service fuzzing values open, and it's going to load all these values in there. Now a lot of these values are not printable, so you may see blanks, but they're they're on, they're represented. They're in there. And we're going to say intruder start, and I said we're going to look for the differences. Here's the baseline request. That's why it's important we start with a known good request that returns a legitimate response. It doesn't have to return any data; it just should return any errors. You may not necessarily know what to send to get the actual data out. Is that based on the question you already reported, or is that one that you put in your file? 
And the baseline request was the one that we used the repeater tool to generate. And then after we were satisfied that we had a good baseline to compare against, we transferred that to the intruder. Let me make this a little bit clearer. So you can see that the attacks are running down here at the bottom. In the paid version, this thing flies. Uh, this is the free version, so it's throttle. So one of the things we can do is let's sort by length because we're looking for what's different, what stands out. You know, if all these ones that are 372 in length are just probably looking like that. So that's not very interesting, right? The baseline itself was 410, so that's what we're comparing everything else against. And then we got this one that's an outlier, a 1495. And it turns out this one is really interesting because it contains some encoded junk that's talking about these SQL errors and there's some problems with some kind of query or something like that. So that's pretty interesting. Well, that's encoded because it's a service, so it's returning XML. No problem. Just take this over to the decoder tab and put it in here. And then, oh, sorry, I had my, my test on the generator. I can't wait to answer. Uh, put it in here, paste it, and then say decode as, and it's your, um, excuse me, HTML coded in this case. Uh, you can kind of tell because of the ampersand kind of thing going on there. Then it decodes it. And you can kind of see our payload landed right here. Go back and look at that a little more carefully. And the request, the payload, is this tick mark. Okay, and there's where the tick mark landed. That's our injection point. So if you're okay, you're done. There's a fail. You report it. Go on. Um, if you're a pen tester, this is where you would go ahead and try to write something that would fit in here syntactically that would do something a little more interesting. Well, we already know the name of the table is accounts. We already know that the, the username and my signature field names from the accounts table. Um, just based on the web service call, we can probably guess what the name of the password field is. Because remember, the, it said you have to pass in the password, <coughs> so it's probably the password. So we can try that. All right, so let's see if we can fit something in here. Well, we're going to need to close that first quote, or right, they got to come in pairs. And then we can just say maybe do like a union attack instead of this one earlier, and it worked pretty well. Select, so username for username, and then we'll select the password and line it up with a my signature. They're probably little strings, so that should work pretty well. From accounts, just copy that from here. Where? Username. Copy that from over here. Hell, yeah, that's right. Where username is whatever. And then right here, we can see that make a <coughs> make it true. All right, so we'll get rid of the stuff that is not ours. Keep that. Look at that tick that came from the website. <coughs> okay, we'll go ahead and try this. It shouldn't work, but uh, try it for to show why it's not going to work. We got some kind of weird error message. <coughs> Reason is, is remember you're going through layers. So the first layer is the web server. The Apache, it's not going to be real happy with all this junk up here in the in the parameter field. But if we go back to the decoder and encode this into URL format, which is what Apache likes to see, and then try it again, it may work out a little bit better. Back this, see if this works a little bit better. And there you go. So you dump the database. Of course, all this stuff at the beginning is legitimate. So you have username, uh, you know, and then the signature like you're supposed to. But the ones at the bottom are that union where we select it from the table again and dump all the usernames and password up. If anybody's tested regular old web pages with this kind of stuff, it's actually exactly the same. Get down to figuring out how to make the calls and find the differences. 
That's the nice thing about it. It is a web app. Alright, so that was testing RESTful services. So for SOAP-based services, we're going to have a pretty similar script. Um, the only difference is, is we need to deal with how to call that service. And on the RESTful service, it was kind of this manual, read the documentation, ask the developer, Google it, whatever, figure it out, try it out, see what happens. Um, the SOAP is actually a, a little more standardized. So if we can get the WSDLs, which is kind of a big if, but usually we can get them then we can have SOAP UI parse those out for us. So the next thing we'll try to do is we're going to try to test the uh, SOAP services using SOAP UI and Burp Suite and combine together into as a uh, one tool. Is there anything about the cats? <laughs> Stuff. It's actually harder to build a project if it's killed the entire room. Alright, All right, let's go back to whoops, back to our website. Time check. All right. Our services. So, <clears throat> SQL injection is a lookup user service. There's a few more of the SOAP services. Okay, so you can see when you browse to the page, there's not really much to see because we're not really calling the service, we're just browsing to the service with a web browser. There's a method get user information that we can call. But most importantly, there's a WSDL that describes how to make that call. So we're going to get the WSDL's URL, go back to SOAP, start a project. You don't even necessarily have to give it a name if you don't want to, because when you paste in the address of the WSDL, it will strip out the file name and use that as the project name. You can do that if it's on there. Or you can give it a different name. You okay? It's going to take apart this mess. Oh, this is a simple call, too, by the way. So There's only two parameters somewhere. I don't know. In there. But check out what SOAP UI does. Is it takes all that apart, and not only does it find the services in there for you, which are called binding sometimes, but it'll go ahead and generate the sample request for you. You can see here that it's got the um, question marks in place because I haven't configured to do that. But you can also flip a switch that'll it'll take its best guess of what might be a pretty good value to give it a shot. Like if it's string it might put in you know, on the low or something like that. Um, and you can let it guess what you think it's type in. So we can send this request. Let's see, let's do the account that I set up earlier. And there's a little play button. You hit play and it'll send the request off to the server and it'll get the response back for you. So here's a valid JSON request. Even better, if you go to uh, file preferences and then go to the proxy settings, you can proxy this tool through Burp as well. At the same time, Firefox is proxy through, so you can send it over. That means we can chain the tools together and use the best respects of both of them. So if we go over to Perk Suite, close the attack we did earlier. Okay, we'll go over to the proxy tab, turn the intercept on. Go back to SOAP, hit play. There's the request. Send it over to repeater. 
release the scope you have to the <coughs> reception, go to the repeater tab. This is getting a bit repetitive from what we've already done. The only difference is the protocol. We need to validate that it's a good baseline request, so we're going to hit go. You can see that we're getting back the response expected, the one we saw in SOAP UI. Now we have a valid baseline request. Send it over to the intruder. And we're going to actually end up doing a lot of the same thing. We're going to clear out these fields because we don't want to fuzz those. We're going to clear out this field because we don't want to fuzz that one. Actually, probably just do this. Clear all. And then we can say we're going to fuzz maybe the username field or the password field, or you can do both at the same time if you want. It'll just iterate through one and iterate the other. Unless you change the attack type. Payloads, load that file. It's on there somewhere, so you can see them. Intruder, start the attack. And you can sort by link. Usually all the people would start. <coughs> There's an outliner that kind of jumps out. Here's the one that kind of jumps out, but it's the baseline request, so there's nothing special about that one. All right, we'll pause the attack. Check out the outliner in more detail. Double click on it. Here's the request we made. It's that tick again, so no surprise that it elicited the same response. There's the query, and then we would run through the same exercise to, do the to build the export and the exportation. The only real difference was the how we started off the uh, assessment. We started off by figuring out how to call the service, and that's what was different between the two. But once we got past the, making the valid request, it was the same exact method after that. Methodology, I should say. All right. So Break the projector again. Yes. <coughs> Do you make any funny stories? Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> All right, so we said that's how to test. That's the practical aspect of it. That's the part that I see most developers in QA have the most trouble with is the practical assessment that you can actually get done in a day. You're not sitting there all day keyboard trying to test one day at a time. So, the what to test? Well, there's going to be a few different categories of things we're going to try to test. No pun intended. So we're going to we're going to fire some character injections. These are um, what was actually recommended uh, by <coughs> John, John originally, and also includes the recommendation you had with the null. Well, mark, mark out with the null. So these are all just ASCII characters. But also, don't forget to encode them you know, with the uh, JavaScript encoding, because you're going to interact with JSON interpreters. Don't forget to track HTML, you never know. And of course, XML, definitely. You've got XML parts are coming back in. So. Target the interpreters. So these things don't run in a vacuum, right? They these web services almost always have something behind them that you're interacting with. You may not know what it is, but chances are there's maybe a database, SQL Server, Oracle, uh, what, a DB2, perhaps, I've seen that before. Uh, DB2 databases are often found behind uh, mainframe web services. Those are interesting. So uh, you also might have um, XML parsers, NQs, email servers. Active Directory, so you got to send in the special character sets from all of those tools, which you can just get off of the manufacturer's uh, website screen tools. And of course, these are web applications. So try to main injection, SQL injection. Try to see if you can get cross-site scripts through the service. And you never know what client might actually end up getting that payload down the road. You're going to target the business logic. So you got that's the sponge. <laughs> so the, uh, you're going to try to do, um, you know, fetch, alter, insert, and delete all those different records. You're going to try to figure out if you can bypass the authentication or the API key, or maybe they use HTTP services. I think anybody would do that. 
but you know, crazier things can happen. Maybe you can intercept a request and you can get between the client and the server by using a network layer attacks, you know, header cap to get machine in the middle of the tax form. You can do cross site request forgery just as well on services, if not easier than you can on web pages. Is it fair to say that you're using the same exact tactics that you would use to export a regular web application mm -hmm. post get? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're doing. And that's kind of my point. Is it's the same set of skills, it's just same a different set. syntax. Yep, the only difference is, is at the very beginning we had to determine how to call the service. And so there were some special techniques we used to break down the XML or the SOAP or the rest of it. And we, we had to get past that little barrier there, that learning curve, to figure out how to make the valid request. And after, got that. after we got the valid request, we didn't do anything different. So the same way we tested the REST service, we flew through the SOAP service, right? And then we would have used the exact same methodology to test a normal web page. So basically what we're, what we're saying is, is these Tests are not that hard to do. Somebody ought to be doing them. Burt Pro will get rid of that throttling that you saw in there, so you, won't, you don't have to wait. You can run through all your thousand or so test scenarios in like a minute. Uh, it's about 300 bucks, so not really a showstopper for enterprises. When you consider a tool like that Hailstorm web spec might be, I don't know, 125,000. Yeah, pretty good value there. Uh, you're also going to have the ability to use free tools like Zap, if you don't mind, a little bit more of a learning curve than, in my opinion, than, uh, no point more to do than what uh, Burt has. And really, to have a quality application, you got to have the functionality, which is usually being well tested. You got to have the performance, which is sometimes <coughs> well tested with tools like Load Runner and some scripts. And then you also need the security. They do have overlap. If you're missing any one of those three elements, it will affect the other two. So, guys, negative uh, one minute for some questions. I have a question. Okay. Um, regards to your testing, uh, do you find you can test more services internally or externally for corporations or for whatever? Externally, because the because they care about what's on the internet because of the exposure. So you have many, many, many more people who can attack that, that, risk, that, risk. That, that risk. So yeah, when you so you you still want to take into account the value of the service <coughs> and what it, what it can go wrong. And then you want to take into account the exposure. That's whether it's on the internet or inside a company. And then you also have to. Uh, Consider its uh, business continuity. So, in other words, if maybe the service doesn't have any personal identifiable information or credit card or whatever in it, but if maybe if I took that service out, maybe I could, uh, I don't know, shut down the hospital. Or so, there may be a business continuity. Yes? A lot of uh, services have the key they have to pass in. That's a key, yeah, key typically is what you call that. Yeah, what kind of uh, things? you find uh, vulnerabilities in the key? Um, you would just fuzz it. Yeah, so, you know, if you pass in the key, what happens is <coughs> it should work. That's your baseline. Yeah. If you don't pass in the key, it's not supposed to work. We, we should try that. And then if you pass in the key plus us extra characters, what happens? Uh, you definitely <coughs> want to try in that situation where you have a key, it's a string. So you want to think string field, pass in a normal terminator on the end. Uh, Things like, you know, whatever you would do to test a normal web application string, you would do to test the API key. And then it's the logical attacks. What happens if I pass the key and if I don't pass the key? So we're going we're gonna to try the fuzzing level, and we're going to type the business logic. So well done. If you're working with developers, I assume that the end game here is to make your applications more secure. So what resources are you really pointing them to, besides just pointing out their errors, what resources are you pointing them to to help ensure that they're actually <coughs> secure? Well, uh, like I said, my, primarily what I do is remediation. So I'll actually say it's an developer and uh, show them how to do it. But if you don't have that resource, I would recommend a uh, OWASP website. And it's uh, got a lot of information that can get you started as far as how that should have been here. It's, it's not going to have everything. 
possible. Are there any good books that you refer people to? Um, or sites other than OI? Off the top of my head, no, but you know, when I Google stuff, when I Google stuff, I, I'm real wary about what they tell you because they think they're wrong. Okay. If you just randomly Google, like, how do I fix that? So you just like threw a dart as a board and you pick the page, chances are the way they're telling you to fix it is not right. At least not possible. So, uh, give an example if you will have a fix SQL injection, the chances of you finding the right answer are like a million to one. I've never seen the right answer. But I would start with the OS website and go from there because they're pretty trustworthy and at least they're industry standards, so these are kind of all on the same page. But you can also hire um, consultants, obviously, that do what I need at full time and sit with the developers, read the source code, and show them how to do it. You can do static analysis tools that are <coughs> sort of the same thing, kind of like for the real obvious stuff. The static analysis tools, like Fortify's one of them, will point out how you should have wrote it. Of course, they're only going to find what's very well known and very well understood. If you've got to really have a custom code or, or you have a logical error, you're not going to find that with the source code analysis tools. They don't find logic problems. So that's when you need that product with consult. Like me. So, secure at least. <laughs> All right, well, it's lunchtime, so I don't want to hold you up any more. I will tell you that if you want the slides, the videos, the notes, the software updates, it's all one account. Uh, I post everything to that account. I just send you the URL to get the toilet updated, if the videos out, and I post it, whatever. It's all right there.